Hello my quilting friends! My name is Leah Day and welcome to this great quilting debate all about can you use bed sheets in your quilts? And really this is going to go beyond just bed sheets. I want to talk also about pretty much all of the different types of questionable fabric that we can use in our quilts, ranging from fabric in big box stores, which I don't think is a very big deal at all, to the totally weird stuff that is, you know, cutting up our clothing, playing with very different materials like silk and wool and, of course, bedsheet fabric and flannel and all that other kind of stuff. And, you know, pretty much I can say straight up from the very beginning that my opinion is yes, fabric is fabric, is fabric, is fabric, is fabric. You can use it in your quilts. You can make whatever you want to out of them. Now that is with a caveat of you may end up with some questionable results, but hey, that might be what you're going for. Uh, if your aim is to create an heirloom that lasts for the next 600 years and your great, 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 great grandchildren are using your quilt uh, in that length of time, well, I don't really know what to tell you <laughs> because quite frankly, none of us will be around by then and I can't tell you what will still be around either because the simple fact of the matter is all fabric, all cotton, all silk, all wool, it all wears out. And if it's being used and loved, which is what I hope you want your quilt to be done with, I hope you want it to be used and loved and washed and dried and drug around the house and used to build forts and put on a bed and rolled around under and all that good stuff. If that's happening to your quilt, it's gonna get worn out no matter what. And I don't care if the fabric is, you know, that $14 a yard, you know, gold standard quilt making fabric from a local quilt shop, or it's the bottom of the barrel bargain bin basement store fabric, uh, or a bed sheet that you bought at a thrift store for a dollar, it's all gonna wear out eventually anyway. And my point of view, real simply, is just that, you know, it's all good and you can use all of it in your quilt. But I do want to dig into this just a little bit deeper because I do think it's fascinating to know where all these opinions come from and kind of where the judgment can originate from because it can sometimes, you know, pull in a little bit of our quilting history and pull in a little bit from the different techniques that we have uh, that have set the foundation for this wonderful craft. And if we don't understand where we're coming from, then sometimes we can, you know, make decisions or learn things like, oh, you can't use bed sheets in quilts and not understand that that really only applies to a certain type of quilt or a certain type of quilt making process. So, you already know, I'm gonna say you can use anything you want in your quilts. I'm giving you permission to do that. But uh, let's first start with bed sheets, and that is, can you use a bed sheet like as the quilt backing? Could you buy maybe two or three bed sheets and cut it up and make a whole quilt out of it? That number one question. And I see this debated a lot in different groups. It's come up in my uh, Facebook group. It's come up on YouTube several times that I've seen it. And sometimes it can get kind of nasty with people saying, you know, oh, how dare you, <laughs> you know, kind of getting a little aggressive about something that's really a very common and, and I, my opinion at least, a very good question because you go to Walmart and there's a you know a pack of bed sheets. You know you get a nice flat bed sheet, big, huge, giant piece of fabric for fifteen to twenty dollars. Uh, the equivalent, a size and shape of fabric would probably be upwards of eighteen to twenty-five dollars a yard, and you'd need at least two yards of it, if not three, to do your whole quilt. So price-wise, you know, to me it makes sense, and it's a it's a very very good question. So the reason why we had this whole question about using bed sheets and why a lot of people have said no, 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 don't use that is from hand quilting. And the reason is bed sheet material is quite densely woven. And of course, bed sheets, you can purchase them based on the thread count. So a 200 thread count bed sheet is not a very good bed sheet. It's kind of a cheaper end, right? Uh, it's not gonna feel all that great against your skin uh, if it's being used as a sheet. Uh, but as a quilt, it could be perfectly fine. If you get on up into the four, 500, 600 thread count sheets, 
the weave is getting so dense and so intense, it could cause you some problems with actually inserting your needle through the fabrics. And this is something that I will honestly say that I don't have any experience with. I have used weird materials for the backs of my quilts in my quilts and I did use one sheet a long time ago and I fussy cut out sheet material so I can tell you that was a pain and that was before I was starching fabric it was kind of a nightmare but I didn't find that it was any kind of an issue as far as my needle hitting that sheet material it was kind of a loosely woven sheet anyway so as far as getting into the denser side of things I've never experienced that personally I have never had a needle break from hitting a bed sheet type of material that's just my experience uh, so I have personally never heard of that but I have heard from hand quilters that the hand quilting process, trying to insert the needle into a very densely woven bed sheet can be really hard on your hands and that can be really hard to get the needle to pop back up again and be able to do the rock stitch and be able to, you know, quilt her it fairly quickly. But the question is, that's for hand quilting. That is a technique and that's an issue that hand quilters experience. Is that gonna be something that machine quilters experience? And I think the answer is it depends. <laughs> so uh, I read a little bit and I found some long armors did have some issues being able to quilt through bed sheets. If you're a long armor and you get a lot of people bringing you bed sheets as backings, uh, definitely comment and share your experience. And if that's a problem for you, if you've had to reject uh, bed sheets as backings or you don't like to see that, or you do like to see that, I'd love to hear from you and know what your experience is using that on the long arm. Uh, so far, I've seen that home machine quilters, people that are quilting their quilts on a machine, on their home machine, on a tabletop, moving the quilt, not moving the machine, moving the quilt under the needle, it doesn't seem to be a problem at all could be the type of the needle that you're using and the size. Uh, so the denser the weave, of course, the tighter the, the fibers are locking together. If you use a sharper needle, you know, I typically use a universal needle, but if you switch to something like a sharp, that might work better. It's one of those things that I think if you want to go weird <laughs> or you want to use something in particular, and that's the material that's working for you, maybe monetarily or it's just more convenient you know you can find the color that you want in a bed sheet you can find the size that you want in a bed sheet then in my opinion it makes more sense instead of you know worrying about it working or not working buy it and then make it work for you you know figure out if your machine can take it if it can't take it how it's set up right now then change your needles change your thread keep playing until you find the right combination of things that will work that will allow you to use that material that's most convenient for you uh, so bed sheet as far as it, the, the density of the weave there is one thing that does cause me to question whether that's actually not necessarily true, but whether it's really such a big deal, and that is batik fabrics. So batik fabrics have a much denser weave in general than regular 100% cotton fabrics. So if I'm comparing the feel of a batik to, let's say, something really, you know, like just a typical cotton print. Like this is just a typical cotton print. And in fact, actually here, I've got a cotton print. It's a, it's a half square triangle of already piece. I've got a cotton print on one side and then a square of just a plain black solid on the other side. And so I've got batik, solid, and print. I'll be honest, the print feels the softest and the thinnest. Maybe it's just this particular variety of print. The solid feels very stiff, but that could be how many times I've starched it. <laughs> but I can actually see through the weave. If I'm holding it up to the light, I can see through the weave on the solid. The batik can't see through the weave and it's super, super dense. So right there, you've got three different feels of fabric that you can experience just within the traditional quilting cotton that would be sold at your local quilt shop. You know, it's going to feel different depending on whether you're using a solid, a print, or a batik. And I have seen uh, a long armor once uh, kind of 
griping a little bit about someone combining solids and batiks in the same quilt. She was like, every time I hit the batik, I've got to go and adjust my tension. And you know, if you're quilting over a lot of different fabrics, that could be really annoying. If you've got a section of solids and you've got a section of batiks and you've got to remember to go and adjust your tension every time you hit that section, then that could be a little annoying. You know, it's one of those things, I think it depends on how much attention you're paying to the process. Uh, there are, and, I mean, and I know personally, there are some quilts that, psh, you know, a uh, little bit of attention issue, not gonna be a problem. It's a, you know, it's a gift or it's just not a super mega important quilt. You know, I'm just kind of working through it, getting it done. You know, I might let that kind of thing go and it won't be important. If it's a show quilt, if it's something super special, then obviously, obviously going to be a lot more obsessive about making sure that every time the tension is perfect all the time. Uh, you know, so I think that, you know, and I hope this illustrates that there's always going to be a different focus depending on what your quilt is for. And this gets back to the whole heirloom thing. If you want your quilt to last 600 years, I don't really know what to tell you. <laughs> you know, that's up for a major debate. And it, you know, it was really down to, do you wanna make something that's actually gonna be used and enjoyed, or do you wanna make something and put it in a box or a time machine or something like that? I mean, I just don't know what to tell you because this stuff wears out. No matter what you're making your quilts out of, it wears out, it wears thin. Now let's talk about the whole big box store thing. Cause this, I'll be honest, drives me a little crazy. And I stumbled upon it last summer and it was really kind of unexpected. So a little bit of a reference. I do, I did Quilty Box, you know, pretty much every month I would get these fabrics from Quilty Box and I make a free quilt pattern and I uh, share a tutorial on it. Well then Joanne Fabrics, which is a big box, fabric retailer offered to send me a box of fabrics and said, you know, hey, would you make something cool for us and share a tutorial the same way that you do Quilty Box. So I agreed, you know, it was a, a straight up collaboration. I was able to be honest and say, hey, Joanne Fabrics sent me this stuff uh, and did the tutorial almost straight up exactly the way I do the other tutorials for Quilty Box. What I received was lots and lots of, of almost angry comments on that particular post. Uh, demanding that I be critical and judge the fabric. Now, first off, I never open a quilty box and start going, oh wow, this fabric feels cheap, or oh, this fabric feels, I mean, like, that's so rude. <laughs> I'm never gonna do that, guys. I don't care where it comes from, I'm never gonna do that. Uh, and I didn't notice any difference between the Joanne Fabrics fabric and my typical fabric that I get myself. So I didn't even, I didn't feel a difference personally and I'm, I would never say that. Uh, second off, uh, now for a long time, I did not actually know that there was a difference in the quality. And then I listened to some podcasts and I actually heard some actual, the pr basically the presidents of the companies that actually ship the fabric to the Joann's and Walmart stores. And yes, the base fabric, which is the, the, the gray goods that starts out, um, before the fabric is printed, before it's dyed, before it's colored, that gray goods fabric is lesser quality than what you would get at a quilt shop at an independent store. So a manufacturer, and there will be a manufacturer that will have like a division for big box stores, and then they'll have another division for um, independent quilt shops. So they have kind of these two different uh, almost two different businesses and two different business models for these two different avenues. And they'd get lesser gray goods, not as good a quality, and send that to the big box stores and then they get the best stuff and send it to the independent quilt shops. So, verified, I've heard it from presidents of companies that they actually do this and that's a verifiable thing. But here's my point. That fabric, even that lesser quality big box store fabric is still one million times better than what my grandmothers or my great grandmothers were sewing and quilting with, right? So I still have quilts that my great grandmothers pieced and quilted and made and they're still around. 
And that fabric was super mega thin when it was brand new. And now, you know, it's, it's not doing all that great. I'm real careful about how those quilts are kept and stored. And, you know, they don't get washed very often. They don't get used a whole lot. I do like to pull them out and use them and, and cuddle up with them, but I'm not gonna be as hard on them as I am gonna be the quilts that I just made last week, right? Uh, so, this just to, to start out with those quilts, you know, already had fabric that was being made and manufactured, you know, 45, 50 years ago, not the best quality, but they're still around. And so the way I look at it is if that was good enough for my grandmothers and my great grandmothers, then that's good enough for me. And I feel like if, a, you know, if this whole thing about the expense, really kind of is mean. It really is because not everyone can afford 14, 16, 18 dollar a yard fabric. And I never want to tell someone, hey, you can't do this unless you get the best stuff. That's not fair and it's also not true. You can make quilts out of anything. You can make quilts out of bed sheets. You can make quilts out of your clothes. You can make quilts out of upholstery fabric if you want to. Whatever you got, you can make a quilt out of it. You know, I have a quilt that I made out of corduroy uh, and different dressmaking fabrics because that was back when I was sewing professionally for a company and they let me cut up whatever they had. They had jean material, they had corduroy, they had very little quilting cotton. I mean, none, basically. So I had to kind of make do with whatever I could make out of their traditional dressmaker fabric. And that still made a great quilt. It's extremely heavy. It's, it's a great wintertime quilt. And that's the thing, when you start playing with these different materials, instead of thinking of it as something so weird or so different, or, you know, oh my gosh, it's not gonna be the right thing, start thinking about, oh wow, what will this make that will be so different from the normal? You know, like, you know, typical normal quilt with, made with two layers of 100% cotton fabric and maybe you get kind of stuck in one type of batting, you're gonna have the same weight with every single quilt that you make. You wanna make a nice, heavy, you know, weighted blanket for the winter time that you just get underneath it and you snuggle up and it's like, oh, you know, this is just perfect. You know, then you want to start playing with jean material and corduroy and the heavyweight stuff, wool, and really start going into that heavyweight stuff and just see what will happen. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I mean, maybe something weird, but also maybe something really awesome. And you might end up making your favorite quilt that's just a joy to pull out every winter. And you wouldn't know unless you tried. But the last thing I want you to do is ever feel like you can't use a particular fabric because so-and-so said you shouldn't. Well, so-and-so might have just stuck herself into a box and that box, all it's ever gonna do is get smaller and smaller and smaller with every single bit of judgment that you add to it. Oh, don't buy fabric from a big box store. Oh, never use a bed sheet. Oh, what, you're playing with wool? How dare you, <laughs> you know? The more rules you put on it, the tinier and tinier and tinier space you have to play in. And then pretty soon you're working with just quilting cotton and it's only purchased from one place and it's only the batting that that place sells too. And so you pretty much are only just making one type of quilt. And that, in my opinion, is a recipe for boredom. And if you're feeling bored, you're not having fun. And it's going to get really tedious really quick. So I absolutely think that the world is your oyster and fabric is fabric is fabric is fabric and you are open to play with anything that you want to. Use bed sheets for your quilts. It's cheaper. It's probably gonna work great. I would stick with 100% cotton just in general just because sometimes I have found personally when playing with the polyester blends that can cause some funky tension stuff when it comes to free motion quilting. As far as walking foot quilting, you might be able to get away with just about anything, who knows? Um, when it comes to bed sheets, play around with your thread count, whether you wanna go with the super high, you know, 600 Egyptian cotton luxury <laughs> sheets, or you wanna go with the lower thread count, 200 thread count, play with it. I mean, you won't know what's gonna work and how it's gonna work until you actually play with it and see for yourself. 
I really wanna play with a flannel bed sheet and I wanna put that on the long arm because that sounds like a delightful thing to put on the back of a really warm, nice heavyweight quilt for the winter. So that's definitely gonna be something I'm looking into in the next couple of months. When it gets into weirder fabrics, so let's say your t-shirt fabric, silks, crepe de chine, you know, getting into those kind of stranger things, look at how stretchy it is. I mean, that's kind of my, my go-to thing is, okay, is it stretchy? Can I control it? If it's super stretchy, try stabilizing it. All t-shirt fabrics and stuff I stabilize with French Fuse. It's a lightweight, fusible interfacing. It does not add a thickness or a stiffness to your quilt, but it definitely does stabilize those t-shirts so that way they're not gonna stretch out of shape on you as you go to quilt, as you go to piece. It makes everything just a lot more stable. I also encourage you, if you do a t-shirt quilt and the t-shirts have been worn out, meaning that you've you know really worn them out, you've picked holes in it and stuff, uh, I made Josh a quilt and I had, he had already really worn the t-shirts out badly. Uh, and unfortunately, many of those t-shirts are now just completely shredding apart. And I need to go back in and basically cover over the originals with more t-shirts and really quilt it densely to hold it better in place. So my advice with that, if the t-shirts are already very worn, I would definitely do a foundation, which means put another piece of fabric behind it to stabilize it too on top of the French fuse. And that's just gonna add that extra layer, the stability, if the t-shirt starts to tear away, it's not gonna tear away straight into batting, it's gonna tear away into more fabric. And the denser that you quilt it, I mean, I'm not talking like micro stippling. <laughs> I'm talking like maybe quilt it on a half inch scale, half inch between those lines of stippling, you know, lines of quilting and maybe do a stippling over the surface, that's gonna minimize the wear. It's gonna minimize how much it moves and, you know, slides against itself. And so that's gonna stop the t-shirt from really degrading and falling apart. I didn't do a lot of quilting on that quilt that I made for Josh and it really did wear, wear apart a lot faster than I think it could have. Getting into the even weirder stuff, silk, silk cotton blends. There's a really beautiful radiance fabric. Um, I would stabilize that again with fringe fuse just to simply stop the stretch. Uh, I would definitely look at, you know, hey, if you want a piece with something like that, it's gonna be weird. Uh, it might not come out perfectly accurate. So instead of obsessing about it and nitpicking it and, and just beating yourself up when it doesn't work out, Look at ways of hiding your mistakes. Can you applique a button or a flower or something else on top of those places where things join up to hide those joins? You know, that's an idea too. It's not always about making it perfect. Sometimes it's about hiding those issue pressure points instead. Uh, and I think all of that is great stuff. And the key here, ultimately, make the quilts that you wanna make uh, make the quilt that really is gonna rock your world and make the quilts that you can afford on your budget. You know, it's okay to say that not everyone can afford $12.99, $14.99, $18.99 dollar a yard fabric. You know, that's okay. And not only that, but it's really limiting on the craft to say that we can't use these materials. We can. Uh, I don't know about you, but I got a lot of worn out jeans and I got a lot of t-shirts and I got a lot of weird stuff laying around that would be fun to experiment with. And you know, you don't have to experiment with a bed sized quilt. Sometimes that is biting off way more than you can chew. If you're wanting to experiment and you're really just kind of feeling bored with the traditional quilting cotton, I encourage you to either make baby quilts or go even smaller than that. Hoop quilts, placemats, pot holders, all that kind of good stuff. It's good stuff and it's great sizes to play with and allow you to know, hey, is that material gonna work? Or am I gonna start breaking 50 needles or break my machine or you know something along those lines? It's kind of good to know before you commit yourself to this massive project, you know, a king size quilt made with blue jean fabric. I mean, be kind of good to know that you're gonna need special needles and special thread on something this big than when you have something this big, you know, something gigantic. So experiment, give yourself permission to test and play. 
If you have sheets that are, you know, maybe a little bit worn out in the center, but just perfectly fine all along the edges, cut out that edge fabric and try piecing up a couple of blocks and see what happens. If your machine doesn't eat it, then I think that's a sign that you can play with it. <laughs> that's at least my opinion. You know, if my machine really wants to eat something, that's usually where I draw the line and say, okay, you know, unless I really want to do it by hand, I'm generally going to back off at that stage, but I have not yet found any material that my machines won't eventually, with a little coaxing or a needle change or a thread change, won't eventually decide that they'll play with too. So I hope that this podcast has helped answer that question for you, feel a little bit more confident about the materials that you're using, and I hope this has encouraged you to try something new. If you're feeling bored, that's a bad sign with any craft. And it might be a sign that, you know, all of those rules or judgments or whatever has kind of started to shrink your world. And you've got to fight that because, you know, once your world shrinks down, it's really hard to be truly creative. And there can be a lot of fear that gets kind of tucked up in the crannies and corners with that too, because that fear will lock you in place. Well, if I do something different, it won't be good enough. If I do something different, so-and-so will judge me. If I do something different, it's wrong. And I really wanna encourage you to understand that there is no right and wrong. Yes, there are a certain number of things that you can do to win at quilt shows, you know? And there's that, that game to play if that's your thing. But as far as the quilting for yourself and making quilts for, just the joy of the craft and to be able to make that quilt out of blue jeans and make that quilt out of t-shirts and make that quilt out of a bed sheet, all of that's good. There is no right and wrong as far as I'm concerned. There is no wrong way to make a quilt except maybe to make the top and then never quilt it and be able to enjoy it. That's really the only thing that I think is the wrong way to do it. 